is it possible for people to pray unconsciously? I suppose the question is, is it possible to pray without being conscious of it? Not pray in an unconscious, while in an unconscious state. I'm just uh, deciphering this. Sure, I mean, you know, in the sense that one is praying and the mind goes somewhere else. So, the mind is not there. It's possible. But not generally. It stops if the mind goes away. And uh, <coughs> the point is, will I get karma phala if I pray unconsciously? What is your idea? Yes? No? Maybe? No. no. Because free will has to be there. And then unconscious <laughs> actions done unconsciously, free will is not there. Like in America there was a case, a court case. This uh, man, I don't know if he, it was a long time ago, I don't even remember if it was a man or a woman, I think it was a man. He lived with a roommate. He was into sleepwalking. Doesn't know what he's doing. Just goes from room to room in his house. Went to the roommate's room. Beat him up nicely. <laughs> he didn't die or anything, but he was nicely beaten up. Came back to his room, slept. And the, the roommate is a mess <laughs> full of cuts, bruises and everything. Didn't know what was happening. Of course, the next day he moved out, sued him, <coughs> and the case went to court for a <coughs> police complaint and everything. But he won. The sleepwalker won the case. He said, and he was able to demonstrate, like since childhood he has been sleepwalking, some people do that. They have no idea what they are doing. And so he said, I must have been having some kind of a dream. In fact, I like this man very much and I have no problem with him. But uh, I must, uh, I am not in charge of what I did because there was no intentionality. Intentionality means free will it was not there and I was not conscious of what I did. And he felt very bad also, but uh, he won the case. He regretted it. He said, I really regret it and he paid for the treatment and everything. First beat him up and then pay for the treatment. But uh, one is not culpable in that situation. And uh, so, if one is not culpable for Papa, then the same should be for what? Punya also. Because what makes an action, what makes one be accountable for an action is free will. If free will is not there, then it is not, uh, it doesn't count. Then, do we accumulate, ah, see, that's what it was. Uh, do we accumulate punya papa for unconscious or subconscious actions? Because for such actions, we have non-association with being the karta. So do they count? No, they do not count. One must be genuinely not conscious of what one is doing. It's not like one is pretending to be <laughs> unconscious, but is not is quite conscious. No, no, because you know, in, in sleep, if you kick somebody, or in sleep walking, if you beat up somebody, you're not culpable. And so the the feeling that I am the doer, that identification with the karta not being there, then that karma does not accrue papa or punya. Just like <coughs> when a donkey kicks, there is no papa punya. The donkey, if the donkey kicks a sadhu, who are you going to blame? <laughs> sadhu. 
will say, hey, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I thought you were a scholar and a knowledgeable person. Why are you standing behind the donkey? You will talk to the sadhu. You will not tell the donkey, oh, you have done papa karma by kicking the sadhu. What is the use? It will then kick you also for saying that. <laughs> so, the animals have the free will to do, but they do not have the free will to consciously not do. In other words, the donkey has the freedom to kick, but you have the freedom to not kick, and the donkey doesn't have the freedom to not kick. If it feels like a good kick is coming on, it doesn't see who is behind, who is on the side. It will just kick. This is the difference between animals and human beings. Human beings means that intention, that sankalpa must be there and that free will must be in operation. Sometimes, you know, it also is on the level of work. I say something I did not mean, it just comes out. But then you know you have said something you, have, you don't mean and you take accountability for it. So, like Nachiketa's father said, I'm going to go to hell, he told his son, <laughs> basically. Go to Lord Yama, I'm giving you to death. Mrityavetvam Dadami. <clears throat> One of the false notions jivas have to get free from is the notion nobody loves me. Yeah, true. The, the love that one might receive in relation to other human beings is often conditional, which is antithetical to the true nature of love. Limitless, timeless, non-discrimination, non-discriminating, etc. Given this lived experience, isn't nobody loves me true because Ishvara isn't a somebody or an object. None of us can be capable of really loving one another as we are because that love is partially recognized Atma in another. Please help me understand and overcome quote unquote nobody loves me. <laughs> Lots of people love you. <laughs> that is one, that is the first antidote. And many, it's a very nuanced question, many, many layers of it. So let's see if we can first unpack the question. How to unpack the question? What is the question to unpack? So many questions are there. First is, this is what one has to get over. This feeling, nobody loves me. True, yes, because nobody loves me is, is, a, is a feeling because, uh, what is that? Uh, because of a certain incompleteness within oneself. When children used to tell Pucha Swamiji, and sometimes adults also would say, Swamiji, I love you. He would say, I know. <laughs> he wouldn't say anything else. I know that already, he would say. So, and then somebody pushed it a little further. How do you know I love you, Swamiji? So he would say, simply because I am lovable. <laughs> this, was, this was his response. I, I am lovable. I know I am lovable. There is no reason why you should not love me. And therefore I know you love me, unless you say something otherwise. <laughs> I'm going to assume you love me. So that is a very uh, wonderful response, really. So I learnt a lot from uh, when he used to respond like that. So here, uh, so the first one is this, that the feeling that I am, uh, nobody loves me, is really not about anybody else. It is the feeling I am unlovable, after seeing this example from Swamiji. 
So nobody loves me, quote unquote, has to be retranslated as I am essentially unlovable. You see, now it's a completely different question. Because the second part of the question states that nobody loves me may be true because love is very conditional. I love you, therefore sit down. <laughs> I love you, therefore listen to me. I love you, therefore do this. And if you really loved me, you would have done this. So this is the quote unquote what goes by the word of the concept of love in the everyday um, human interaction. So yes, it is conditional. So then we, first thing we have to do is to see that, is to transfer this. Nobody loves me, we have to convert it into I feel unlovable. That's why I say nobody loves me. Second is, uh, is love conditional? Yes, for the most part it is. But even in and through the various uh, conditionalities, the unconditional love comes out because that is one's nature. Moksha is bringing out that loving nature, which is why in the instruction given by sage Yagyavalkya to his wife, uh, he, he talks all about love. It was just very beautiful. He talks about love. And he says, what one loves is not another, but the self that is already lovable, already pleased. This is what Atmanastu Kamaya Sarvam Priyam Bhavet or Bhavati means. So then if I don't know that I am all love, then I feel separated from that love and then I want to go get it from somewhere. Not only do I feel separate from that love, because of Atma Ajnanam, I feel not worthy of love. Not only I don't know I am all love, but I feel unworthy of being loved, whatever that means. And that's how the conditionality develops. The conditionality develops because I have to threaten someone and then make them love me. Otherwise, why is anybody going to love me? I have to say, you have to do this. Otherwise, this is not whatever. So I have to scare them, I have to give conditions because otherwise I'm not going to get it. This is the feeling, because I feel unworthy. So then the first premise, I am not, I am unlovable, now has a new translation, new conversion, I am unworthy. You see, this is what is the expression of Atma Ajnana. I am unlovable, therefore I am unworthy, and since I feel unworthy, I have to get my self-worth from, from mattering to at least one more person in some way, form or the other. I have to have a friend, I have to have a life partner, I have to have somebody or a group of somebodies. What are they called? Significant others. Significant others who will care about me and who I can have in my life in order to feel safe, in order to feel a sense of security, in order to have that self-worth. This is the thing. And how many people are in the world? 8 billion. So if 8 billion people are seeking security through this kind of a thing, naturally it will be conditional. How can it be unconditional? Naturally it will be conditional. But even though it is conditional, once in a while, one just does something randomly. It is all love anyway. You do it because you spontaneously feel like doing something for somebody else. You don't expect anything back. You don't, there is just a joy in doing something. There is a joy in giving. There is a joy in appreciation. And that is when one is already in touch with the self that is already pleased. This is what Asti Bhati Priyam means. This is why Sat Chit Ananda has been converted into Asti Bhati Priyam. Asti is 
everybody ha knows everything about is 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 isness we are all experts in that now and then bhati knows all knowledge that also we know self effulgent i bhati this priyam is a very funny thing ananda priyam means what that everything becomes lovable to me no that's not true everything becomes lovable to me means what scorpions and crabs <laughs> snakes other creepy crawly things yeah why go that far cockroach yeah, all these things are not lovable the upanishad will say otherwise they will say yes they are lovable how come they are lovable they are lovable far away their absence is lovable <laughs> so certain things are lovable because of their presence and certain other things are lovable because of their absence so the further away i am from octopuses and then what else uh, snakes and crabs and scorpions and other biting things then i am free i am happy it is it is a source of love for me so that love which i seek i already am it's like that greek god narcissus he looked at his reflection ancient greek god and said oh who is this wonderful beautiful young man haven't laid eyes on anyone like this let me give him a hug and then of course he didn't get a hug back he got wet that's all and then again after the water uh, settled down again he looked at himself and fell in love with himself all over himself and then he just pined for himself because he did not know vedanta <laughs> yeah he did not understand vedanta it's kind of a metaphor a sad metaphor for atma uh, avidya atma anyam that's all it is when atma avidya is there one is in love with oneself but one does not know it so as we grow in this knowledge what happens is that this ananda which is the, the dynamic form of this ananda is love that love comes out without any reason without any purpose without any condition the more and more it comes out because the heart is like a lotus and then the lotus only opens when exposed to sunlight otherwise it doesn't open the sunlight is vedanta shastra the sun of the vedanta shastra falls and then the lotus opens very nicely that is exactly what is happening so when we allow the heart to open more and more and more then there, there are no inhibitions one person asked pujya swami ji in a satsang a very daring question swami ji what's the difference this is exactly the tone uh, of the question swami ji yes what is the difference between you and me this was the question that's why i said a very bold question daring question i don't see any difference what's the difference between you and me and then swami ji thought about it and said well he said i don't know anything about you because it was the first time he was meeting this man but uh, he said when i meet somebody when somebody comes my first thought is how can i help this person and then everybody was just so uh, happy with this answer because that's not most people's first thought most people's first thought when they see a stranger is are they going to rob me <laughs> should i catch my purse Uh, tighter <coughs> should i hide where i keep my money what do they want first uh, you know one sizes them up okay dressed like a professional okay oh no no dressed like a thug uh, how do you know what a thug dresses like you know but still there are stereotypes in the head there are assumptions dressed like a thug up to no good 
there is like a well uh, you know coming from a well to do noble family this is all the assumptions and then what may they want from me oh oh looks like they are asking a donation let me hide you know this is this is most people's view of meeting other people they don't know that's because the heart is still struggling to open it's not that it doesn't want to open it wants to but it is still in the process of opening it's not it there are certain inhibitions inhibitory factors are there and so that is why uh, the uh, that is why the suspicion the distrust so what we have to do to be all love study vedanta or rather i should say do not stop studying vedanta that's what i was saying have i answered all of it oh the last part okay what is the last part uh, so then maybe it is true given this experience that love is conditional isn't nobody loves me true uh, no not necessary love is inhibited the expression of love is inhibited they are not able to express it they can only express it in conditional ways in every family there are funny ways of expressing love they are very funny and nobody even these things uh, thinks about it in some families there is conflict and then if somebody shouts at you you feel loved i don't know how but that's how it is and if nobody shouts one feels unloved nobody has shouted in one whole day oh my god what's happened <laughs> and in certain other family you have to have a vociferous discussion and lots of disagreements then only you know you are loved and in certain families if you eat then you are loved if you don't eat then you are not loved so like this there is many many ways <laughs> and this is just human nature that's how it is vikram ka you will see okay very good pankha theek hai
So many tempos and so many tones. Yeah. Hmm? Very nice lyrics, yes. Yeah. I want to explain the lyrics one minute. So it is just like uh, the stories, the message of Rama and Krishna are like gems which are being spread in every single lane. Nobody is there to take it. So the singer is saying, encouraging people, take this, take this. And then instead, if people are becoming the worshippers of wealth, they become, what is that, you know? Poppers and the people who are taking these teachings become very, very rich. So it's like that. Very nice, uh, uh, nice question. So, as, as usual, I was singing Portuguese. Aqua song. Uh, aqua song. No, this is not about aqua. Uh, this talk about our nature, and it's funny because I decided that I will sing today and talking about our nature that is love. Mm. So this mm. is the lyric talks uh, mainly about that.
Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnam 